Beloved in the Lord, the peace of the Lord be with you. I welcome you to the Presbyterian Hour, a special ministry of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Amen. May our continuation be in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, we are going to enter into a moment of prayer to thank God for His goodness, for His mercies. Therefore, with the wonders of heart, let us approach the throne of grace and thank Him. Let's adore His holy name for who He is. He's been so good to us. Just look back. From the beginning of this year, the Lord has been good towards us. He has been good to you. He has been good to me, our families, friends, and loved ones. Let us pray and thank God. Let us adore his holy name for who he is in the name of Jesus Christ. Beloved, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord of heaven and earth, we come into your presence in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Together with your whole church throughout the world and the company of heaven, we adore your holy name. You are great, holy, wise, and loving. You are beyond all our understanding, and you have made us and all things for your glory. Therefore, together we say, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was from the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Beloved in Christ, again, we are going to come before the throne of grace and ask him to wash and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as we confess our sins. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. But when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah says that indeed our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. Let us approach him, ask him to wash and cleanse us from known and unknown sins, confessing before him. That's the reason why Jesus came to die on the cross, for our sins to be cleansed. Therefore, go into your heart. Ask him, what have you done wrong? What did you say wrong? Where did you go wrong? Ask him, Lord, wash me this morning. Cleanse me this morning. That as we approach our throne of grace, nothing will be a hindrance. Our sin, the sins that we have committed against our neighbors, against God, will not be a hindrance in our approach to God this morning. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. And as you also confess, believe that he has forgiven you. That is what his word assures us. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all our hearts. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have been unfaithful in your service. Have mercy on us and cleanse us from our sins. Help us to overcome our shortcomings through Jesus Christ, our Lord. These are words of assurance of pardon. Shall we all listen and believe that, that the Lord has forgiven us? May the Almighty God, who fulfills his promises of redeeming grace to all who truly repent, forgive you all your sins through the perfect sacrifice of Christ our Lord and keep you ever more in the peace and joy of a holy life that you may love and serve him all the days of your life. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, this is now the moment that we want to come before God with our personal needs. There is something on your heart you want the Lord to do for you. As you pray for world peace, you are also praying, laying your bedding before God that he should come to your aid this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord is willing to take our burdens. Therefore, let us come before him. Tell him what is on your heart. You know that he is able to do far more than we can ask or think. His word says we should commit our ways into his care and he shall direct our path. Commit your ways to him this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. He says he will hear us. Pray for world peace. Pray for our nation, Ghana. In the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful to you this morning for bringing us into your presence through this medium. We are grateful to you, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord, we are asking that, Father, you continue to unveil yourself to us through this service. Father, we thank you for your grace and preservation upon our lives. From the beginning of this year, you have been so good to us. Therefore, we say, Lord, thank you. Lord, we commit this service into your very care. We ask that you guide and lead us. That at the end of this service, we would all testify that indeed the Lord has ministered to us. We give a thanks. We give a glory. Holy Spirit, come and take preeminence about this service. We bless you. We honor you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us now hear a portion of scripture for our meditation. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Let us hear the word of God. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I would do. I will tear down my bands and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goose. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, 
This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Amen. in Christ, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We are grateful for our lives and grateful for the privilege we have to sit at your feet, for you to instruct us in things pertaining to your word. We pray that you cause your voice to be heard in the power of your word. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Beloved in Christ, our theme for reflection today is set your hearts on things above. The statement, set your hearts on things above, is one of Paul's way of describing the attitude that defines a believer in Christ. This attitude comes about when one realizes what Christ has done for him or her. Paul teaches us that the believer in Christ has been raised together with Christ. The believer is united with Christ in his death and resurrection. That is what Christ offers to those who believe in him. The believer knows that Jesus Christ died in his place. He rose again for his or her sake, and he did all this just for him or for her. So when we believe in Christ as our Lord and Savior, Jesus transfers all the benefits of his death and resurrection to us. The believer is now found in Christ. Paul says his life is now a life in Christ. Again, he says such a person has died and his life is hid with Christ in God, such that when Christ appears, he or she will also appear with him in the same glory that Jesus will appear in. 
So the believer is united with Christ, bound to him in his death and resurrection, and is consequently found in the new life and victory over sin and death, and the power and freedom to live the new life of righteousness and the bliss that comes from above. This is the fact about the true state of the believer. And it is the starting point of the life of the believer. It marks the beginning of a process in which the believer is progressively transformed practically into the new life of Christ. Paul says this new life is constantly being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. In the process of this renewal, the believer learns through knowledge of the word of God and the enablement of the Holy Spirit to put to death the earthly things in him or her, namely sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. The word translated covetousness actually means greediness. Someone has observed that greediness is not limited to the love of money. Greediness also manifests itself in extreme fondness of food and drink, honor and fame, power and sex. No wonder in the Colossian text, it is mentioned at the end of a list of sins that have to do with evil appetites and desires. Other earthly things mentioned in the text include anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk, as well as lying to one another. All these represent lifestyles which are inconsistent with one whose heart is set on things above. The basic human problem with which we were born as fallen beings is selfishness. This sin sets the focus on oneself for gratification and has no room for the interest and good of the other person. It is this sin that breeds greed, covetousness, wickedness, adultery, and all corrupt practices. It is the root of all the relational problems we have in marriage, among siblings, in our workplaces, in church, and everywhere. In Luke, Jesus responded to the plea of a young man who wanted him to tell his brother to give him his share of the inheritance, apparently bequeathed to them by their father. It was very clear that his brother had appropriated the entire inheritance to himself alone. The man, no doubt, was not pleased with what his brother had done. Interestingly, Jesus did not give the man any direct response to his plea. Rather, he took advantage of the man's request to teach about covetousness and greed. It was as if all along, Jesus was yearning to teach on the subject and simply took advantage of the man's request to teach what was already on his mind. The parable Jesus used was actually a commentary on our attitudes towards the good things of this life. In the parable, Jesus challenged or called attention to the futility and folly of greed when it takes hold of us, when greed takes hold of us, it takes us on a path of folly and futility. So Jesus said in the parable, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. 
I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, and be merry. But God said to, to him, you fool, this day your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Beloved in Christ, the lesson of the parable is not about the abundance of farm produce the rich man had. It is neither about the quest for how to store them. Rather, it is about the poverty of the man's soul that is revealed in what he decided to do with his abundant harvest. In the poverty of his soul, he saw no opportunity for any hungry mouths to be fed apart from himself. In the poverty of his soul, he never considered an opportunity to help any widow in his neighborhood apart from himself. In the poverty of his soul, he never saw an opportunity to touch the life of an orphan, a homeless person, or an abandoned person. All he saw was himself, and all he considered was himself. A very good example of a selfish and self-centered person. He told his soul to take it easy because he has lots of goods stored up for himself. He and himself alone. Of course, how could he make use of all these before he died? But at night, God came in and spoke to him and said, Tonight, your life is being required of you. Now tell me, whose are these? The goods you have amassed, whose are these going to be? Beloved in Christ, if you can see the poverty of the soul of this man, you should listen to the response God gave him. You fool, you fool. This night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose would they be? The man had indeed toiled for nothing. And that is what Jesus said. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. In other words, everyone who lays up treasure for himself or herself on earth and is not rich towards God is similarly walking on the path of folly and futility as this rich, rich man did in the parable. So the lesson of the parable is clear. It is about the folly of thinking only of oneself. The folly of thinking that all you get through hard work are meant for you alone. And if you are the only rich person in your family and you fail to bring others up, all the burdens of the family will rest on your shoulders except if you don't care about anyone. But mind you, that is the folly Jesus Christ is warning us against in the parable. If you are rich, you fail to bring anybody up, fail to help anybody to come up, the burdens of the entire family will rest upon your shoulders. And even with that, if you fail to, to take care of the burdens of the family, you are walking similarly in the path of folly and futility as this man in the parable walked. And if you think that Jesus is exaggerating things here in the parable, let me call your attention to a few things. There are children who have become so rich and yet care little about their parents who are struggling with what to eat, what to drink, what to wear and where to lay their heads. And there are people who think that poor people are lazy and deserve their lot. Hence, they have no pity or sympathy towards poor people. And I want to suggest that it is very easy to have all the reasons in the world to behave like the rich man in the parable 
who had no consideration for any other person apart from him himself in the face of the abundance of the riches he had been blessed with. I want to submit that what God said to the rich man, he says to every greedy person in our world today, the time comes when all of us take our bow and leave this world behind. Some who do, do so haven't poured themselves into the lives of others to enrich and power and bless the souls of men. Such people will enter through life in joy. Even while on earth, their reward will greet them in many ways. But others will take their bow and live in sorrow and regret because all of a sudden, they will understand that they have toiled for nothing. They will realize they've had, they have had all things only to have nothing. They have had all things only to have nothing. They will realize that they have had all things only to make no impact of eternal value. They will realize that they have had all things only to have no investment that makes the soul pleasant, joyful, and content. May we never miss the true purpose of the wealth of this life. May we never commit the error that the rich man in the parable of Jesus in Luke committed. May we never miss the true purpose of the wealth of life. We miss it only to embrace a life of folly that puts material things before the good of human beings. We miss it only to embrace a life that has no feelings towards the suffering and plight of others. We miss it only to embrace a life of folly that fails to see wisdom in living and making space for others to live too. These attitudes are shaped by whether or not our minds are set on the things above. Those who ha whose hearts are set on things above are rich towards God. Their priorities go beyond this life. They relate to things on earth knowing their less comparative value in the face of their riches in heaven. They know that the things of this life must be used to secure eternal things, eternal riches, and eternal goals that give pleasure to God and bring joy and relief to people. True life it's not about seeking the abundance of things. The proper object of human worship and human search is God. But greed shifts our attention from God and becomes an object of worship in place of God. Greed can dictate our attitude towards the things of this life. Greed can take hold of us. Greed can possess us. And when it does, we become drunk with greed. We will kill to satisfy greed. We will destroy other people to satisfy greed. We will deny other people what they deserve to satisfy greed. We will trample upon the weak to satisfy greed. We will lie. We will gossip. We will blackmail and destroy others in the hope that we will have our way to satisfy our greed. And it is all because we have allowed greed to take possession of us and have become drunk with greed. I want to observe that there is a national concern that relates to greed and covetousness. Our country is suffering from a systemic evil, which unless we take deliberate steps to cure, will make it very difficult for us to develop as a nation. Now I'm talking about our winner-takes-all party politics. Our party politics is such that 
Every party in opposition prays for the failure of the party in power, works for the failure of the party in government, and undermines all the good initiatives designed for national development. The system is such that so long as the party in power succeeds in government and development of the nation, the party in opposition has no chance of coming to power. Therefore, our politics has become a game of mischief and lies, misinformation and misrepresentation of facts. Regardless of which party is involved, the opposition sees its main preoccupation to be yesemo, 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 yesemo. The opposition, regardless of which party is involved, is preoccupied with demonizing the ruling party and finding fault with every good thing that is being done for the good of the nation. So in this situation, how can we develop as a nation? How can we develop with such systemic evil? And why are we not talking about it? And why are we doing nothing about it? But we all know that this system of party politics is our curse. Because the two parties in opposition and in government just cannot work together for our good. One must pull the other down in order to go up. And that is why we are where we are today. So how can we develop? How can we move forward as a nation? I want to suggest that it, the time has come for churches and other religious bodies to come together to begin a campaign to change this system and get rid of, and get rid of such systemic evil that we have in our nation. The heavenly values for which we work are clearly against mischief, deliberate lies, misinterpretation and misrepresentation of facts. They are against winner-takes-all take, systems. They are against blackmailing people. They are against a few people becoming rich at the expense of the masses. Our heavenly values are about the promotion of the cause of the weak and the vulnerable. They are about building systems that empower people to rise above poverty. Our heavenly values do not make people callous, inconsiderate, thoughtless, and insensitive. When our hearts are set on things above, we care about the plight of those around us. When our hearts are set on things above, we derive our joy from the joy we bring into the lives of other people. When our hearts are set on things above, we value our common well-being over and above our personal well-being. When our hearts are set on things above, our success becomes the success of all. Our riches becomes opportunities for us to create circumstances that will change the lives of other people for better forever. When our hearts are set on things above, not only will our success become the success of all, but even our riches will become opportunities for us to have other people's circumstances changed for the better forever. So when our hearts are set on things above, we do not feel that we are high only when all others are down. We are truly high when we are there together. So even as I bring my sermon to an end, I pray that the Lord will help us to set our hearts on things above, to live with heavenly values that embrace care and consideration for others, even as God blesses us, even as God 
gives us promotion, even as God endows us with the good things of this life, we will still live with the heavenly values that embrace care and consideration for one another so that we do not become the only people who are rich. We, are, we do not become the only people who are living well. We, are not, we, are, we do not become the only people who have some comfort in the affairs of this life. And I pray that the Lord will grant us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. So, Father, we come before you. I will pray that your spirit will help us, quicken us, prompt us. Help us, O oh Lord, to avoid the mistakes in walking the path of folly that disregards others, their interests. The path of folly that considers no one except ourselves in the good things of this life. May we live with the heavenly values that will take care of others when your blessings have become our portion. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for hearing us. For we pray in that blessed and much, much less name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved in Christ, we thank God for using his servant to bring his word to us. It is our prayer that the word of God that we have heard through his servant will bring the needed transformation in our individual, societal, and national lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us now draw near to the throne of grace in prayer of intercession. We're going to pray after hearing the word of God and all that God has for us as individuals, as families, and also as a nation, let us now depend on those words and pray, believing that the Lord will hear us. We also know that the word of God comes to correct, to convict, to instruct, and to train us into righteousness. Therefore, I want you to pray and thank God for his word in the name of Jesus Christ. Where have you been corrected? Where have you been convicted in this word? Where have you been instructed? All these is for our nurturing that we set our heart on things above. Beloved in the Lord, let us pray that we shall seek the welfare of others, our neighbors, our family members, as leaders, both political, societal, and religious leaders, we shall not pursue selfish ambitions, but seek the welfare of the masses. Seek the welfare of those that the Lord has brought and has given to our care. Let us pray that the Lord will have mercy on us, that we shall seek their welfare, as Scripture tells us. This week, this month, this year, may the Lord lay a burden on our hearts to support and give a helping hand to someone, that we will put a smile on the face of an orphan, that we will put a smile on the face of a widow, of a widower, of a venerable person in society in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray that the Lord himself will strengthen us. He will lead us as we, as we set our hearts on things above. These are things that the Lord expects from us. His word has come strongly seeking and encouraging us that these are things the Lord expects from us as people who have come to the knowledge of Christ and his grace that is so sufficient for us in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord stir our hearts as individuals, as leaders, wherever we find ourselves. May the Lord lead us 
that in all this we will know that whatever we do here on earth, one day we shall be accountable to the Lord, to our maker. Therefore we will not be greedy, we will not seek our self-ambitions, but we always want to come to the Lord asking him to guide and direct us as to where we can meet the needs of other people in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us continue to pray for world peace, that the Lord himself will grant peace in Russia, in Ukraine, and all other war-torn areas in the world. That the Lord himself will also touch us, will touch our leaders, that our economy will also grow in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord grant us the needed resources as a nation we already have, that we shall be able to make use of these resources that he has given to us as a nation. In Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we are grateful to you, Lord. We give you all the thanks and all the praise for your words of exhortation through your servant. Our prayer is that, Lord, let it be a burden on our hearts as leaders, political leaders, religious leaders, wherever we find ourselves, that we shall see the good and the welfare of others in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that, Lord, you continue to lead and guide us in this nation, knowing very well that we cannot do anything without you. Therefore, we commit our ways unto your hands, O God, that you shall direct our path, direct the path of leaders in the name of Jesus Christ. That we shall see the fortunes of this nation being turned around. We shall see the fortunes of society being turned around. Our families in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we pray for a renewal in our communities. For a renewal in our nation. For a renewal in our world. In the name of Jesus Christ. Above all, knowing very well that one day we shall be accountable to you, our maker. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you the glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we have prayed. Amen. Beloved in Christ, on behalf of the leadership of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, I would like to thank all our donors for your continuous financial support toward this special ministry, the Presbyterian Hour. God richly bless you. Everything shram. Mauna Yirami. Amen. Please, you can also donate for the expansion of God's kingdom and for this worthy cause here on earth through the account details on your screen. And as we usually do, we shall acknowledge your donations. You have watched and you have been part of this service. Please, if you want to worship with us, kindly get in touch with any of our Presbyterian Church of Ghana congregations closer to you. The leadership in these congregations will warmly welcome you to serve the Lord as a disciple of Christ. We are looking forward to seeing you in these congregations as we integrate you as members in this congregation. You become a member of the larger community of Christ. God richly bless you. And therefore, until we meet again next week, remember that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. In him we live and move and have our being. And above all, set your heart on things above. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now unto God's gracious mercies and protection, we commit ourselves. Unto God's gracious mercies and protection, I commit all of you. Brethren, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord God of Israel lift up the light of his countenance upon all of us, even now and evermore. And the blessing of God Almighty, who alone is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with all of us now and evermore. Amen.